Aloha everyone and thank you for joining the COVID-19 Public Health Action Webinar, Hawaii State Budget and CARES Funds, What to Expect in 2021. My name is Steph Moyer and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Before we get started, we want to go over some Zoom housekeeping. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We are not offering any continuing education credits for the Public Health Action Webinar Series. And lastly, all webinars are recorded and will be available on the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. Our first speaker will be Beth Easting. Beth is the director of the Hawaii Budget and Policy Center, a project of Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. The Budget Center researches tax, budget, and other public policies related to expanding economic security and opportunity. Beth's interest in promoting economic security was fostered by decades of work in health policy where she observed the strong connections between poverty and poor health. Her career includes serving as healthcare transformation coordinator in the offices of Governors Abercrombie and Ige, CEO of the Hawaii Primary Care Association and Executive Director of the Kalihi Palama Health Center. Our second presenter today is Jill Takuda. Jill is currently a special advisor to the Hawaii Data Collaborative. She is leading the COVID-19 spending project which tracks and monitors federal funds awarded statewide in response to the pandemic. Prior to this work, Jill was a member of the State Senate for 12 years. During her tenure, she was chair of the Ways and Means Committee, where she was responsible for balancing the state's $14 billion state budget and negotiating and determining approval of all fiscal measures before the legislature. And it is my honor to turn it over to Beth. Thank you. Let me see how I can manage to uh, share my screen here. Okay, am I on or not? Um, we can't see your slides if you want to try one more time. Yeah, let me see what I can do here. This always works. Nope, that's just still not working. Okay. Oh, there we go. We can see them now. Okay, good. And you can see the slides because, okay, good. All right. So, um, thank you for inviting me. I am always happy to talk about the state budget. And those of you who may have seen me talk about the state budget have probably already seen this slide um, from Joe Biden, which talks about, uh, don't talk about your values, show me the budget. And this is really important because our budget is our most significant expression of public policy. Uh, when you think about it, there is nothing more important that um, in, in public policy because it shows how much we're spending, where we're spending it, who's going to benefit, and who's going to pay for it. So the budget is the most important thing that we can look at, and yet uh, those of us who have tried to understand the budget know how hard it is to come to grips with. Um, there are all kinds of uh, reports and pages and pages of things to, to go through, and all of it is in a very user-unfriendly uh, kind of format. So um, you, you do you not need to do a lot of data entry if you want to analyze the budget. So we did that data entry and we analyzed the budget and we put together a data a budget primer uh, that we hope all of you who are interested in the budget will take advantage of and um, tell us whether it is meeting your needs and what more would be useful to you. But I'm going to rush through some of the basics of the budget right now because I know you really want to talk about um, the upcoming budget. But I'm going to go over the, the basics of the budget process. We are here. 
Uh, at the end of December, the governor is going to be releasing his fiscal biennium budget. So the state runs on a fiscal year, but when it comes up with its budget, it uh, puts one together for a two-year period in, in the odd years. So the fiscal biennium will start um, July 2021, and it will end June 2023. Uh, the governor produces the budget, the legislature um, amends it and approves it. Uh, it goes on to the various uh, departments and branches of government, and then the whole process starts all over again. Most of our budget spending goes into operations, and the vast majority of operations are in the executive branch. And by that, I mean the, uh, the departments like the Department of Health, the Department of Human Services, and so forth. There is a skinny little slice there available for the judiciary, um, less still for the legislature, and a mini little piece for OHA. And in addition to operations, uh, the budget includes a capital improvement uh, amount for pop uh, capital improvement. And so that was $8 billion for the um, fiscal biennium coming to an end. It gets distributed across different uh, departments. And the important thing to remember about the capital improvement budget is that the money for that comes from bond issues. So we borrow the money for capital improvements. Uh, the operating budget has to come from regular revenues. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on the executive operating budget. This shows that there is quite a bit of variation in how much each department gets to spend uh, from the very small amount that goes to the governor and lieutenant governor uh, and the Department of Human Resources down to the real behemoths. Uh, the Department of Budget and Finance and the Department of Human Services. Education is also really big. Uh, and th that really is, a function, is, uh, is related to their functions and what they do and where they get their funding. While we're talking about the operating budget, I also wanted to highlight that in among those departmental budgets, um, there are a, a lot of money that gets spent um, in service contracts. So I think in this group, we all know that the state does a lot of its health and human services via contracts with nonprofit organizations. So the amount for fiscal year 2021 was about $575 million, which is certainly a big amount, uh, larger than the whole budget for a lot of different departments. And it's also uh, very vulnerable right now when we're looking at potential budget cuts. Now let's turn our attention to means of finance. Um, no expenditure can be appropriated unless it is connected to a specific source of money that's going to pay for it. And as you can see here, our general fund is the largest uh, source of funding. So the general fund. It's 50, it pays for 51% of the budget. Other major sources of revenue include special funds, and special funds are created by the state, um, and they, the, the revenues are related to the purpose for which they're spent. So a good example there is UH tuition. When students pay their tuition, it goes to the state, but the state can't spend it for anything other than to support the University of Hawaii system. Um, but it's notable that the University of Hawaii system can't help themselves to that money that's sitting in their account. It still has to be appropriated by the legislature. We also get a lot of money in federal funds, and most of that money is um, uh, allocated on a formula basis, so it depends on the size of the state, the poverty, number of roads of high, uh, miles of highway, stuff like that. So one of the things I found, and I mostly got this from looking at the Hawaii data set, uh, data collaborative site that Jill is going to be talking about. Um, but, you know, the, the state got a lot of money appropriated through Congress 
related to the pandemic. So we're all aware that there was coronavirus relief funds, and those are supposed to be spent at the end of the year. And some of it came to the state, some of it to the counties, and so forth. Um, but in addition to that, there were other funds that were made available to state departments. And I'm calling them CARES funds. Some of them came out with different names, but it amounted to about $804 million. And the interesting thing about this is that these funds, for the most part, don't expire at the end of the year. So according to the data collaborative, about half of the money has been spent, the other half is still available, and I have not so far found any evidence that it's accounted for in the budget, either in what's being shared by the Department of Budget and Finance or, or by the legislature. So it may show up in the uh, fiscal biennium budget. But um, anyway, it's good to know that there, there may be some extra money out there that uh, it has not been fully accounted for yet. Now let's turn our attention back to general funds because that is really the basis for the rest of our discussion today. General funds support about half of the budget, as I said, and it really is a very important source of funding for the budget because it's the only money that we have available that has any flexibility associated with it. So special funds can only be for a special purpose. Federal funds can only be for the funds that can only fund the things that they're made available for. So general funds, in theory, can be spent for a lot of other things, although they are fully spoken for, for the most part. Um, but the general funds are so important to us that it is the focus also of the Hawaii Council on Revenues. So Hawaii, uh, by its state constitution, has a Council on Revenues, which is independent uh, economists who take a look at a variety of things, but largely focus on general fund revenues uh, to predict how much money is going to be available to support the state budget. And under the Constitution, the legislature and the governor have to pay attention to what the Council on Revenues comes up with. They cannot spend more than is projected to be available uh, to, the, to be spent um, in most years. So you can see that uh, in 2019, that was the last full fiscal year that was unaffected by the pandemic. Uh, general funds were $7.9 billion. They dipped in 2020 with the last quarter being affected by the pandemic. And then the council projects a real big dip um, after that and not a recovery for a number of years to come. But the, the chart that really freaks us out is this, and it, it really is the same information, but it shows the deficit in expected revenue over the next several years. So this is all compared to fiscal year 2019. So that was the benchmark for the budget. And then we see that the budget was reduced by about a quarter of billion dollars last fiscal year, uh, $1.2 billion and uh, seven, uh, 729 million. So basically what this is showing us is that for the current fiscal year and for the fiscal biennium, we have a $2.3 billion budget hole that needs to be accounted for when we are looking at our budget. And for those of you who want to geek out on the report from the Council on Revenues, I think this is interesting, although maybe not terribly critical for the discussion. And that is, it shows, uh, it breaks down uh, what their expectations are for where the tax money is going to be coming from. And the interesting thing here is mostly that they don't project uh, recovery for individual income taxes for their entire projection. And I think that they probably are wrong about that, uh, mostly because the Council on Revenues also comes up with a, uh, uh, an estimate of personal income growth. And when they came up with that in October, they were surprised to see how robust 
that was because of all the federal stimulus money. So this is probably going to change um, for the better the next time they get together in January. Now with all of the focus on general funds, um, that will certainly be one of the places where the budget is going to be seeing how they can reduce spending. So as each department has a different amount of money, they also have a different dependence on general funds, meaning the percentage of their budget that comes from general funds. So as you can see, transportation and consumer affairs, they don't get any of their operating budget from general funds. It's all special funds and, and federal funds. Um, and on the other end of the scale, you have public safety and uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, all of their operating funds come from um, general funds. But probably more important is to look at the amount of general funds that goes into every budget because uh, like, you know, the governor gets 100% of the budget from general funds, but it's only $5 million a year. Uh, and because of the functions of these different departments, it's unlikely um, that a 10% cut, at least I hope, a 10% cut would not be applied to every single department, uh, department's general funds in the same amount. So to go on, as we are looking at the big mess that we have to deal with, we can take comfort in the lessons from the Great Recession, uh, which was not really all that long ago. And the lessons are very important but also are not going to be all that easy to heed. So the first one is that economic recovery depends on spending. And when the private sector doesn't have the ability to spend money and conduct business as usual, the public sector needs to step in. And that's really important, but hard for the state to do. That's why we look to the federal government for various kinds of aid to stimulate our uh, economy. But if the feds ultimately don't come up with more stimulus, um, we do need to see how we can use state spending to maintain uh, the economy. Because there's an important multiplier effect here and the economists estimate for every dollar that is spent by the public sector, whether it's the feds or the state, uh, there is a, a dollar fifty in economic value, so you get more for your money uh, if you use if you if you spend money on the public sector. But unfortunately, for every dollar cut from the budget, um, that has a dollar fifty um, effect on the economy, taking out reducing the economy by a dollar fifty. So the last thing here uh, under number one is austerity ca casts a long shadow over recovery. And basically what that means is that when you make deep cuts to any function or department, it takes a lot of work to recover. Um, I, I know that there are still some government functions that have never been restored uh, since the Great Recession. And there are also studies that show that the states that cut the most of their budget, uh, took the longest to recover and start build, rebuilding their economy and increasing jobs again. So the second point here is that government services are really necessary uh, for people who are out of work and otherwise hurt by the recession. But the good news is when we do support those services, that also supports the economy because virtually all of those things circulate money through the economy as people spend the, the money that they get. Um, also, we need to be judicious about cuts, uh, not across the board. We saw during the Great Recession, uh, furlough Fridays were, were affecting pretty much every state worker and department, and um, that was not a very good thing. So some other lessons, cutting public worker positions also hurts the economy. Whether you get rid of the positions or cut the hours, it is going to reduce economic output. Uh, let's not forget 
State service contracts are also essential to the economy and jobs. Let's not uh, pretend that by cutting those out of the budget, uh, it's not going to do any harm. And for human services programs, cutting those contracts will hurt the most vulnerable communities. And then when we are thinking about where we could spend money, uh, let's take a look at infrastructure. We would borrow the money from bonds so it wouldn't come out of regular revenues. We have plenty of important infrastructure needs. Um, it would put people to work on those infrastructure projects and it would help Hawaii in the long run. So um, we have a $2.3 billion budget hole to fill. This is just kind of a rundown of the things that we have heard uh, or seen in the media or know is out there. So we have rainy day funds, uh, 376 million, we could borrow from the hurricane Re relief fund. Uh, the governor has already borrowed money in the bond market. Uh, there could be more borrowing uh, from the Federal Reserve, if that makes any sense. Um, we can, I, I believe the governor has already said that he's going to defer retiree health contributions and that is contributions to the EUTF trust fund. Uh, they would still be making good on current expenses for retiree health. Um, furlough state workers, uh, my estimate if they furloughed state workers two days a month, um, it could save $300 million, but there are all kinds of parameters for that. Um, Chair Luke suggested freezing state vacancies. Um, there could be a restriction on general fund spending and the governor has uh, proposed $600 million. And then there's also been some speculation that rating special funds could, could help. And if there are surplus funds that don't need to be needed, needed to be used immediately, that would be helpful. And then, Finally, we think that there are some other things that need to be on the table. Uh, and first and foremost, we recommend looking at revenue raisers. So a lot of people have been hurt by the uh, pandemic, but a lot of people haven't. And those who have been invested in the stock market are doing much better now than they were nine months ago. So we need to take a look at wealth taxes, um, also, maybe business uh, tax credits that we give away, maybe have a hiatus for those. Um, if we have to do worker furloughs, uh, we should adopt the short time compensation model, which I don't have time to talk about right now, but it would provide a higher um, benefit level for part-time unemployment. We could borrow some more money. I've heard people talk about maybe selling state land or other assets. So I um, know we could talk about the budget all day, but that's it for me. And I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Jill now and answer questions later. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Beth. That was a, a very concise and impactful overview of the budget. So thank you for doing that. And appreciate that you took that on because usually I'm the doom and gloom speaker about how much money we don't have to spend on very important things. So I'm gonna share now and uh, my portion of the conversation really is gonna focus on a lot of the federal dollars that we have seen come into our state to really help address the impacts um, of COVID-19 since we've been basically um, you know, in shutdown mode since about March. So let me share my screen. Okay, and hopefully everyone can see it now. If not, please alert me um, that you can't see the screen. We can see it. Okay, perfect. All right, um, and so some of you may have seen this as well uh, during a recent House Select Committee, but here are just a few important dates coming up specifically for the Coronavirus Relief Funds. As you know, these are the monies that um, you know, barring any act of Congress, which they are fiercely meeting with, you know, right now as we speak, uh, it is going to expire at the end of the year. So uh, first date, December 11th, um, as we know, Congress is currently negotiating a possible emergency relief framework, which could um, include an extension of CRF allocations. Uh, understanding is some of the drafts do at least try to get them through December 18th and extend, um, you know, their time to be able to pass this this relief package. So we're all looking at both December 11th and potentially 18th to see some hopeful additional relief. 
um, on or around December 14th and 16th, and this is somewhat of a fluid date, what we do know is many of the providers and subrecipients that have been helping to get out the CRF dollars, uh, they'll be meeting, continuing to meet with budget and finance to take a look at exactly where they're at with a spend down so that a determination can be made um, potentially how much of those funds might be going towards eligible general fund expenditures uh, that are allowable under the CRF guidelines or transferred into the UI trust fund. As you know, the UI trust fund was the repository for any unspent funds for many of the programs that were funded through SB 126. December 30th is the deadline for eligible expenditures uh, that are incurred. Um, and so basically they've got to use those CRF monies to be able to cover these incurred costs. That means the service has been rendered or the good has been delivered. Um, in the case of some of the grant subsidy assistance program, the applicant has to be awarded uh, by the 30th and they are allowing a little bit of flexibility in that they can be paid out uh, over a 90 day period following December 30th. So it's from December 31st technically to at the end of March, they would be able to continue to pay out some of those reconcile some reimbursements as long as the expenditure was incurred um, by December 30th. So that then brings us to another date we're looking at, which is the period between December 31st, January 1st through March 30th of next year to be able to finish up all of those payments of eligible expenditures that were done and approved by the end of the year. So just a few dates we're looking at, and as we know, Congress makes another move and we'll have a whole set of other deadlines to add to this page. Um, well, and me. Sorry, yeah. this is Steph. Um, uh, the attendees are asking if you wouldn't mind putting it into presentation mode so they can see the, the slides. Okay. Better. All right. Okay, how's that? That's good, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Sorry, I'm very low tech <laughs> as well, so <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to really share, and if you've been to our hawaiidata.org uh, slash federal funds website where we're tracking a lot of this, is we want um, early on to be able to take a big picture view of all the dollars that have been awarded by the federal government to Hawaii to really uh, support our state, our communities, families, small business, government during this pandemic. And it's a constantly ever ticking number as different awards and drawdowns take place. So about right now, it's at about $10.2 billion that have come in largely through the CARES Act, but also the previous acts that were in place, as well as additions to formulaic um, funds um, that the feds have in place as well. Of that $10.2 billion, we've already basically expended 80.3 billion of those dollars. That means it's gone out into the community, it's helping families, it's helping small businesses. You know, of the 8.2 billion, for example, over 3 billion has gone out to individuals. This has been through things like the $600 UI plus up, um, the stimulus checks that went out, and over 3 billion for small businesses and industry. So this includes PPP, EIDL, those various grant programs. So um, there is, you know, roughly $2 billion remaining that has been awarded to the state for various purposes and reasons. And if you go on our site, you can actually hover over the various categories and see every one of those specific awards and the current drawdown and expenditure on them. Um, but a large percentage of it has already gone out and is gone and um, really shows you that over the past, you know, six to 10 months, we have largely been buffered by an infusion of over $8 billion in federal support. And so that's quite significant when you think about how we've been able to manage, albeit difficult, uh, and what we have to consider looking ahead. Uh, but then breaking it down more specifically, because I know a lot of eyes and ears are looking at the CRF dollars. Uh, for Hawaii, we received $1.25 billion, a vast majority of it going to the state and the county of Honolulu receiving $387.2 million as a separate recipient, an individual recipient. Of those funds right now, and we do know that this is really kind of a point in time um, assessment, People are expending and encumbering um, every day right now, especially as we head to the deadline. Um, but based upon the information we got as of December 4th, in terms of expenditures and encumbrances, roughly about 50% has actually been expended, true expenditures, uh, goods, services received, checks cut out the door, done, pow. Um, we've had another 
compared to 70.3 million or so encumbered, in some cases it could be contracts have been issued, POs are outstanding, um, a matter of just filing reimbursements. Um, if you add those together, encumbrance and expenditures, we have roughly gone through about 70, 75% of the funds to date. Um, if, you're go, if you go on our website and it's clunky when we're on Zoom, that's why I'm not linking it straight to our website, you can actually hover over the various categories and see where we have spent um, and allocated and awarded out the various dollars by counties as well as by state programs. And this progress bar gives you again a snapshot in time view of where we are at in terms of spending. The state being those specific state programs, uh, for example, like the housing relief program, um, child care provider program and grants as well, as well as the county's expenditure rates and each of the neighbor island counties, the portion that they got allocated to them from the state legislature, um, from the original state amount to spend down at their counties. So uh, right now, the state programs, again, everybody is rushing to get those expenditures in and processed, is below 50%, but the rest of the counties are uh, well over 50%, and many have said that they're in the process of getting to that 100% mark right now by taking a look at all of their programs. So this is the current status of the 1.25 billion in CRF dollars. What I wanted to be able to show you as well though is the current status of at least the state CRF funds and allocations. And I apologize, it's very tiny, but if you go to the website, you'll be able to click over the links and um, be able to see the details. But this shows you that of the 862 million or so that the state of Hawaii received, uh, the state government received from the feds for CRF, this is how we're currently doing in terms of expenditures and encumbrances. So as you can see, as of December 4th, we have about 46.2% extended. Again, dollars out, done, you know. Um, we have about 256.8 million, 29.8% that has been encumbered and anticipating um, those POs or reimbursements to be cut, contracted, contracts completed, and money out. So that is um, that assumption there. We do have about $206.7 million, 24%, that right now um, don't have expenditures or encumbrances at the moment. And so a lot of lift would need to take place either for that, um, or as we've said from before, would be looking at has having it go to the UI trust fund or eligible general fund expenditures. Um, some big highlights to note um, that at least right now when we look at all the individual state allocations, and I apologize for the cut and paste, but it is a scroll bar on the website. Um, we have about $444 million in state CRF allocations that have expended less than 50% of their award. So that really means that they have to start making up ground in terms of either making good on those encumbrances that you see in yellow, or even just starting to have any color on the board other than red. Um, and so that's something we really wanted to know, note. In some cases, like for example, uh, the 58.2 million or so that we see uh, in development is what I call it. It currently has no home. Uh, it basically was unallocated and left unallocated following the line item veto of Senate Bill 126. So as you might recall, Senate Bill 126 allocated 100% of the state awards, but following the line item veto, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars were left unallocated. So this is still a remaining pot that um, either has to have a home and get expended by the end of the year, or we know will revert to the UI trust fund or other eligible expenses. There's also about $5 million left in the governor's discretionary fund. The ledge in SB 126 did provide him with $39.9 million. He's distributed uh, quite a bit of it. The vast majority of this particular discretionary fund is $31 million that went to the DOE for digital devices. Uh, that particular pool is 100% encumbered at the moment, just waiting to be um, reconciled as an expenditure. But he does have about $5 million more left there. And just circled a few more that we just have some eyes on because they do have quite large dollar amounts attached to it. Uh, some of the funds that went to DOH for COVID response efforts, uh, for some of the DOD coronavirus response efforts as well, some pretty large percentages which account to pretty large numbers, um, millions if not tens of millions left in these particular awards to still be spent down. Um, some of these awards, as you recall, were pretty big, 70 million for airport screening. Right now we're showing 9% 9 9 of the total 70 million as actually expended. Some large encumbrances, 
um, but still more dollars uh, to be had as well. So there's, in fact, you know what, I apologize. That's the wrong circle we were looking at. Um, yeah, no, that's the right one. Okay, so just concerns about some of these PPE, for example, large encumbrances, waiting for them to make good on that, but very small actual expenditures. So these are the kinds of um, things that we're looking at right now. Again, barring any act of Congress, 100% of these dollars need to be deemed expended by the end of the year in order for us to not have to uh, return any of it to the federal government. Moving on to the next slide, um, one of the things that especially our House Select Subcommittee has been looking at is really um, where did those where did those needs go? How did it help us, you know, get through the last few months? In particular, these CRF dollars, the 1.25 billion that was meant to really respond to COVID-19 and its impacts. Um, if you take a look at our category will we have, and again, you can go online and you can click and see the specific projects attached to each one. What we do know is about 251 million specifically went to COVID testing and contact tracing. Um, another 98 million or so went to public health expenses, which included things like quarantine and other COVID responses. So in total, you're looking at about $350 million specifically that went towards public health needs and direct COVID um, response. Now, one thing we do know is while this has been, you know, the critical period, uh, even with a vaccine on the horizon, these kinds of programs and services will continue beyond December 30th. So again, um, absent any additional federal aid, how will the state and counties continue these particular efforts um, without the funds that have really floated it um, all these months since. You know, another area that's really big is taking a look at basic food and shelter um, type of supports. You know, if you add in restaurant card, which has really been part of the economic um, support category, we're looking at about $237 million, 19% of the total, you know, CRF allocation to the state is going to make sure that people could continue to keep a roof over their head and be fed very, very basic things and needs. You know, so again, um, this has helped to buffer many families, individuals uh, that have been struggling over the, you know, the past six to 10 months. Uh, absent this, how will we be able to continue to make sure that people um, did not fall into houses situations and can continue to, to literally eat? Um, so a big concern obviously here in terms of some of the big buckets of money that CRF dollars went towards big needs that will continue on well beyond uh, the end of the year. Um, now, I hope they're a little light uh, to the end of this particular tunnel, because it's never good to say we had all this money and now we don't. Um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is some hopeful movement towards a negotiation of a bipartisan uh, emergency relief package that hopefully could come up within an, you know, the next couple weeks or so. Some of the things that are included in there, um, one part is an extension for the use of CRF allocations until September of next year. So any dollars remaining uh, instead of going to UI, for example, or even general fund expenditures could be diverted to other important essential needs. Um, likely both the legislature and the executive would need to be involved uh, in the distribution of that continuation as well, given how the monies were initially spent out. It also includes about 160 billion in state and local uh, aid. Now, if it's distributed similar to CRF, Hawaii could be looking at about $1.25 billion. As you recall, um, the CARES Act was about $150 you know, billion for state and local aid. If we're now looking at 160 billion, the hope would be Hawaii would at least get 1.25 billion again, ideally with a longer window to spend it down. Uh, Cause as many on this call know, a short window to spend so much money is very difficult from a capacity standpoint. So as noted here, the previous statewide award was $1.25 billion. It also includes $180 billion in additional UI um, funds. So basically looking at a $300 a week plus up for 16 weeks, as you recall, um, the $600 a week plus up uh, was a huge boost for so many individuals that were um, unemployed. Um, many for the first time, and that really did contribute to that over $3 billion in supports that specifically went to individuals and families uh, during the last six to 10 months. 
if you also recall looking at the council of revenues it contributed to them really looking at personal income as growing this past year uh, which seems very odd but a large part of that is due to both stimulus and the plus up um, being put into play it also includes about 288 billion dollars in support for small businesses looking to continue existing programs like ppp and eidl just to give you a sense of how much hawaii businesses did um, receive from those programs ppp we received about 2.5 billion dollars in support from that and eidl uh, if you look at both the award um, as well as the advanced awards that were provided to hawaii businesses you know you're looking over you know 1.1 billion dollars that were received to date for those so again with another program in play with more money uh, you would likely see similar if not potentially more uh, of that kind of support coming into the state the package also includes about 16 billion in vaccine development distribution distribution and testing and contact tracing. Um, as you know, we've spent, as I mentioned, quite a bit already on the testing, contact tracing, uh, but the vaccine development in and of itself will require resources and increased capacity to be able to distribute that um, throughout our state. And that's a cost we have not yet even incurred. Some other things that um, literally came up looking at it this morning, some new potentials uh, that will be included in the bill. Uh, potentially 35 billion in provider relief to healthcare operations and hospitals. Um, the current drawdown that we've seen on the provider relief fund in the state is about $255 million. So it just gives you a sense of how much we've already been drawing down on it. And with a new tranche of money, the potential for that continued support going into the next year. It includes about 82 billion for educational providers, uh, likely leaning heavily on pre-existing programs like GEARS, ESSER, and, and HEARS. Governor's um, Emergency Education Relief and Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. Wonderful acronym soup that is government, but basically some money that's given to the discretion of the governor, uh, the second, the, the education system in our state, single school district, DOE, and um, higher education emergency relief, our University of Hawaii system, um, as well as distributions that would go out to private providers. Our previous award, uh, and I apologize that I did not pull up at this point yet, the HEARS, um, award, but to give you some sense of how much we benefit from it, uh, we did receive 31 million through the Governor's Emergency Education Relief um, Support Fund and $43.3 million through the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Um, if you'll notice, if you look on our website and pull down those specific awards, much of that has not yet been touched, uh, with good reason too, in the sense of trying to burn off a lot of that CRF dollars that will expire at the end of the year and then be able to jump onto additional programs that have a longer shelf life and be able to use those to support needs going forward. Um, so you'll see that in many particular different award cases, the two billion or so that I mentioned that has not yet been spent, much of it was intentional to be able to rely on those funds for education, for housing and for other needs, at, uh, health, um, rely on that after CRF does go away. It also includes 24 billion in rental assistance. As you know, there's been um, quite a bit of funds from CRF designated for rental housing and support um, throughout our state. It includes about 10 billion specifically for childcare providers and about 6.25 billion for state broadband deployment and connectivity. So there's quite a bit of a drill down if you take a look at what the 908, I think it might have gone to about 918 billion dollar bipartisan package looks like, uh, but it will be a continuously moving target um, as negotiations go through. But some real bright spots out there that some of the big needs that we are concerned about as a state for being able to continue that post CRF there could be some specific dollars and awards um, coming into Hawaii to help us uh, in the coming year. And I'm gonna go over this really quickly because Beth did an amazing job of giving you a budget overview in 20 minutes. I don't know how she did it, uh, but the one thing I did just wanna emphasize, and I've brought this up to a few people before, is um, not only is it difficult because we have less funds, general funds, tax revenue coming into the state, it's gonna tighten our budget, but even before the pandemic, a, num a good percentage of our budget was already going towards fixed costs. So this is just something I grabbed out of the last budget and brief. So this is where we literally were sitting a year ago and taking a look at the budget picture. Very rosy, very nice. It's gonna be years till we get back to a point where we're estimating $8 billion in general fund. 
um, revenue coming in. But if you take a look at this, even at a time when we were good, 50% of our costs were fixed costs. Things like in your own household income, you have to pay before you think about anything else. You know, the roof over your head, the health care um, that you need, all of these things, um, it's the same for the state budget where we were already looking at significant costs for debt service, um, for our OPEB costs, retirement system, health funds, right? Um, Medicare costs, Medicaid costs, excuse me. So these are already taking up over 50% of the budget. Have to pay that first. Uh, before we can start thinking about non-fixed costs. And just to illustrate what's a non-fixed cost, right? They're pretty basic in and of themselves. It's things like education. It's things like human resources and, and supports. It's everything else. Um, and that's quite a bit of need um, and priorities that government will have to figure out now with a diminished general fund base, um, looking at that fixed cost projection with how much we're actually bringing in with estimated you know general fund revenue fixed costs would now take up about 70 percent of our budget leaving only about 30 percent for the legislature and the administration to be able to figure out how to then fund these non-fixed costs again very essential um, services and programs that everyone in the community relies upon which is why as beth mentioned looking at where you tighten your belt further potentially even putting off some of these fixed costs, um, bringing in additional revenue will be necessary because clearly if you look at all these particular costs, and again, these are projections based on good years, um, trying to now shrink that to just 30% of an even smaller general fund base uh, is gonna be extremely difficult, uh, if not almost impossible, without added revenue or tightening up um, in other places as well. So with that, I'm going to um, end my share screen, and um, I think we are going to go into Q&A at this point. Thank you so much, Jill, and thank you to Beth as well. So we will um, jump into our questions, and as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, the first question that we have will be for Beth. What might be the process for creating and passing the um, FY 2021-22 state budget, and how can the public weigh in, especially on cuts to essential services and programs? Um, I am going to um, rely on Jill too, so she, since she has intimate knowledge of how the budget gets passed and how the uh, how constituents have an opportunity to weigh in, but officially the governor turns over his proposed budget uh, to the legislature. The House gets it first. They make all of the changes that they want to to the budget. Um, then they send the House draft over to the Senate. There should be um, hearings associated with each of the budget uh, decisions. Uh, they can be rather problematic in my opinion because it is really hard to sit in a hearing room and understand what's going on across the table um, just because they're talking about uh, line items and uh, information that most of the people in the audience don't have access to. So House sends it to the Senate, Senate sends it back, there is a conference committee, which is even more bewildering, and it is going to be very difficult for the general public to have a lot to say about uh, the, the budget bill itself. Uh, and it, it's always difficult, but even more so than usual because the Capitol is closed. Now, there are also appropriations bills that are more user-friendly uh, appropriations bills are scheduled for hearings. People can present testimony. Um, those that succeed can be added to the budget. Um, appropriations bills are going to be really hard to pass this year with so little budget, so little money. Um, so, Jill, I'm going to turn it back to you to answer that question. Okay, I think. Um Stephanie, the question was really taking a look at the time frame for the, the upcoming biennium budget. 
Yeah, so um, asking what the process for creating and passing mm -hmm. the fiscal year 21-22 budget would be, yeah. and um, can the public weigh in on cuts to essential services and programs? Yeah, um, definitely echo Beth's um, comments that it's going to be a difficult, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult year no, process no matter what, but I think even considering the fact that, you know, how would the legislature be coming back into session, you know, you're not going to be able to run to a committee hearing and testify right? It might be remote. And what will that look like or feel like? And I know a lot of times for people that might feel a little bit detached, like, are you really getting through on the Zoom call in terms of really trying to make your case? So advocacy kind of takes on a slightly um, different edge in that particular sense. What we do know, right, is probably just before Christmas, Governor, like, you know, Beth mentioned, will release a supplemental budget. At that time, I would really suggest to everyone interested, grab that budget and brief and go through it. You know, and it might not be that you can take on the whole mountain, but really focus in on those areas that you care about in terms of funding. Um, because again, what I would guess would happen similar to previous sessions is uh, the other time area to watch really and not necessarily participate is all the budget briefings that the money committees will be having at the beginning of next year. These will be even more critical because in based on the questions that you hear from the lawmakers themselves, you might get a flavor or a sense of where they might be leaning in terms of supporting su certain programs or departments from getting cut as much versus where they might be looking towards um, having to be a little tighter on the dollars in some departments based upon maybe different kinds of revenue they have coming in or the brass tacks of it is the need, right? We just can't fund absolutely everyone and keep everyone untouched and whole in a situation like this. So those budget briefings, honestly, I think could be very important, uh, not obviously to participate, but to observe, to get a sense of where things might be going with the budget. Um, I don't think they've published their calendar yet, but if I had to guess, depending on what the next few months look like in terms of this disease progression, hopefully vaccine really helps out, it could even be a slightly faster time frame. Um, right, this past year, we've never seen anything like this where you take a big recess and you come back and you, you come back again, right? I mean, unprecedented. So I'd say being flexible and adaptive and always being on top of where they're at in the process is critical. Um, I would agree with Beth that appropriation bills this year are even harder. The one Benny of appropriation bills, though, that I found, um, my humble opinion, is yes, it's not the budget, so it wouldn't be able to provide you with a lot of those ongoing, um, continued, you know, costs for different types of programs. But in some cases, if the legislature wants to at least fund a program or service for a year, right, and it's not going to be... Um, you know, continued funding, those are the opportunities to put it in a bill itself. So depending on how they're feeling about the stability of the economy at that particular point, um, appropriation bills are a way to get in some funding for programs and services at a later date than the point in which they have to close the budget itself. So there's, there's always opportunity. It is just really going to be much harder this year, but in some cases they could just choose to fund things not through the budget, but through bills. Because remember the bills, they can only last at the longest, a biennium period, not longer than that. Whereas a budget, uh, if it's built into the base, it's ongoing unless you dig that, that out too. So lots of different possibilities for this coming session. Thank you. So I think uh, many of us on the webinar right now have been getting pings on our phone and it seems like um, the governor has just announced furlough days, um, possibly two days a month starting in January. Do either of you have any thoughts on this? Um, should we be anticipating furlough Fridays for our kids again? And is a furlough basically a pay cut? Um, a, a furlough definitely is a pay cut. Um, so if they, if everybody or whoever is subject to a furlough, and the last time it was, I think everybody, uh, and we would certainly advocate for uh, being more judicious if there have to be furloughs. Don't furlough the teachers, for heaven's sake. Um, and also look at other essential people, not that they're, are all, lots of people who aren't essential but it's a pay it's a pay cut and uh, that means that for two days a month people would be working without pay we have raised the issue about the state adopting 
a different kind of partial unemployment system um, that would pay people who are partially unemployed at a higher salary and it would be less damaging to their to those people's individual economies but i haven't uh, gotten a whole lot of receptivity um, to to that yet and i hope that maybe if furloughs are a, a more real thing that maybe the public worker unions will pay more attention Yeah, and I would, you know, um, this is going to be tricky, right? I'm, I'm trying to read at the same time all the breaking news that you folks have been <laughs> looking at while we've been talking as well. But, you know, it does kind of mention, it sounds like that governor um, has said that public school teachers in the university will be on a slightly different furlough schedule. You know, I think a lot of that does have to do, um, and you folks have mentioned this, with the backlash that we saw as a result of furlough Fridays during the recession, a very difficult period. As a result of that, actually, too, we did pass state law mandating a um, specific number of days and hours for instruction for students, um, 180 days. And at this point, I think it's over 1,000, 1,080 instruction hours per year. Uh, I know many have been looking that, at that recently in terms of how that might have been compromised during this pandemic, but I think wanting to make sure that that doesn't get exacerbated with a potential furlough program and having to take off even more um, from the coming semester for children. So that's really going to be having to, to take a look at. But if it can help reduce the deficit by 300 million as projected for an entire year, um, as Beth had mentioned, with a $2.3 billion deficit that they're having to, to try to make up, that's going to help be part of, of the equation. It's just always difficult when you're talking about asking workers um, to take a 9.2% reduction in pay, um, unless you happen to be one of those essential workers that are exempt, but vast majority of our state workforce will be impacted. And, um, and quite frankly too, then for many of those families, right, they will also be part of that equation of need that we see in our community um, with incomes like that um, slash at that rate. So, you know, it's a changing face of poverty, as I tell people, and struggle. And um, with furloughs like this, you will also see that need carried over to many state uh, workers as well. Thank you. So I do want to acknowledge the time and see if we can sneak in one more question, but I do apologize um, for those questions that we do not get to. So um, the last question that I'll ask is, um, do you think the grants in aid program for nonprofits may be cut by 30% or more next year? If I'm not mistaken, there were no grants in aid provided this past year, and I would be surprised if they entertained the grants in aid for the coming year. Uh, where I would be really <clears throat> concerned and want to keep a close eye on it is uh, reductions in the contracts. So the contracts that the state has with nonprofit providers are different from grants and aid. Uh, these are contracts that they routinely maintain that where the a department has to provide a service and they contract it out to the community. A grant and aid is an organization that comes and asks the legislature for a gift. Um, and during the Great Recession, in some cases, there's evidence that that the contracts with nonprofit providers got much larger cuts than other expenses in, in departments. Yeah, if I could just add here, um, Beth is correct, right? This last session, as usual, a flood of GIA requests, um, that program had to, you know, that was not funded you know, this past legislative session. And we saw that even during the recession, uh, at times there might have been some um, CIP grant and aids, but absolutely zero on the operating when general funds are used for those particular grant and aids. Um, knowing, I think that there's quite a bit of nonprofit partners on this call right now, many of whom are either uh, service providers and have POSs contracts, as Beth was mentioning, with the state or provide valuable services through GIAs. I think one of the things to continue to look at, I know many have partnered with the state as well in distributing the CARES funds and the CRF dollars, is if we do get another tranche of funding uh, through whatever they call this next bill that's currently being negotiated, um, 
I think what we have seen is it was very effective to have nonprofit organizations as subrecipients come in to help deploy these funds directly into the community for so many of the needs that you're working on, whether it be mental health or feeding programs or housing support, education, all these different things. Um, while the state general funds might not be available, I think really maximizing the use of any discretionary available federal dollars that we have to be able to help partner up with nonprofits to effectively get out there on the front lines and meet needs. Uh, I think that's going to be a huge opportunity to which I hope the state will really take a good look at now with the value of some time and experience of the last few months with CRF under our belt. How can we even, you know, better partner with private providers, nonprofit community to really help meet the basic needs of people during this crisis. So Thank you. So I do want to extend a very big mahalo to, to Beth and Jill for being our guest presenters for today. I want to thank all of you who attended on Zoom for joining us. And lastly, thank you to all the HiFi staff behind the scenes for your help. On behalf of HiFi, we want to remind you to continue practicing safe behaviors as we to keep our loved ones safe as we move into the holiday season. So be well, be safe, and we hope to see you on our next webinar next year in 2021. Aloha.